I have a lot of fond memories growing up in the late 90s and early 2000s, but one of the more mundane things from that era that I find myself missing more and more as time goes on are video rental stores. Nowadays, everything is algorithmically optimized to only show you what you're most likely to interact with, things that only and exclusively caters to your existing taste. The sense of discovery that comes with just wandering around a store filled with movies or games new and old that you've likely never heard of before just doesn't exist anymore, and that's a huge shame. When I was a kid, every Friday after school, I'd ride my bike up the hill to the local video store just to browse the aisles and see what new stuff would catch my eye. I was introduced to so many games thanks to that store. Sure, some titles like Paper Mario I probably would have seen eventually thanks to later entries, but there are others like Prince of Persia The Sands of Time or even Grandia 3 that if not for that store, they probably would have never been part of my life and I'd have been worse off for it. But of all those games, there's one that I'm the most thankful for discovering. Walking the aisles like I always would in late 2004, I noticed that something new had hit the shelves. See, I had just gotten my GameCube and was ravenously looking for new games to play on it. Basically anything that had the little purple triangle in the corner of the box signifying a GameCube exclusive was on my radar, and when I picked up the display box and looked at the cover, I was immediately enthralled. Up until that year, the most visually complex games I had owned were on the N64, so when I saw the screenshots on the back, I was completely blown away. I had never seen anything like it before. I needed to see more, so I took my weekly allowance, paid for a week-long rental, a bottle of Pepsi, a big bag of Skittles, and went home. Little did I know that this game would end up being one of the most influential of my life by a developer that would, in just a few short years, make my absolute favorite game of all time. The game that caught my eye back on that day was Batten Kaidos, Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean. And could you blame me for getting drawn in? Look at this cover! And I know it's kind of hard to show off in the video here, but these screenshots, especially for 2004, were unbelievably impressive. I didn't know what pre-rendered meant back then, but whatever it meant, it just looked so good. Especially the one showing off Parnass, the confectionery village. It just blows my mind to this day. And the name, Batten Kaitos, Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean. It's just so gripping. I had no idea what Batten Kaitos was or how you could lose an ocean, but it was just so cool that it didn't matter. Now, I have actually looked up what the name Batten Kaitos meant since then. It's a traditional Arabic name for the star that makes up the belly of the constellation Cetus, the whale. The name itself roughly translates to belly of the whale, although that name has been largely superseded by its scientific name, since that star is actually a binary system because of course it is. That's actually a trend that continues to a lot of other parts of the game. Most of the continents in the game are actually named after stars in the constellation Cetus as well, and just like Bat and Kaidos, most of them now have scientific names since they're actually multiple star systems. The one exception to this is Mira, which is uniquely alone, and that actually tracks really well. But enough astronomy geeking, let's get back to video game geeking. Now, I rented Batten Kaido so many times and was so engrossed by it that when it finally came time for it to come off the shelf and the video store put it up for sale, I bought it. This copy isn't the one I bought back then, I unfortunately must have lost it over the years, but I wasn't gonna just not own the game, so I bought another. All that said, I haven't actually played through this game in quite a few years and haven't beaten it in almost 15, so I'm a little hazy on all the details and am excited to dive back in and engross myself in this world again. I'm also really excited to take a more critical look at it since I've never really put too much thought into the fun I'd had with it before now. Thankfully though, I won't actually even have to set up my GameCube to do that, as in 2023, Bandai Namco announced that both Bat and Kaidos games were getting remastered in a collection to celebrate the franchise's 20th anniversary in Japan. I obviously bought this as well and even imported a physical version because it wasn't released physically in Canada, and since that is the version most people will likely be playing now, that's the one I'll be using for this video. There are a few asterisks to that which I'll get into later on, but I'm just so excited to play through this series again, so let's do just that and see how well Batten Kaidos, Eternal Wings, and The Lost Ocean holds up. And just before we get started here, if you like what I do and want to help out, like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you really want to go above and beyond, you can join my Patreon, you'll see these videos a week in advance, get exclusive updates, and even occasionally get an exclusive video. Alright, plug over. So 
So the game starts out with a scene where you get to name your character, but this is no regular character naming scene. Batten Kaidos has one of, if not my absolute favorite framing devices in all of games, and it comes from how it treats you, the player. Most games will put you in the shoes of the main character of the story, whether they are created by you or not, or will have the player just be entirely separate from the events of the game, puppeteering the characters around while the story plays out. The occasional one will break the fourth wall and acknowledge the player in some way, but what Batten Kaidos does is far more clever. You. Yes, you on the couch. Huh? Me? Yes, you are a character in the story. The story starts with Callus, our protagonist, summoning a guardian spirit from another dimension to bond with him. By creating this bond, Callus has connected the dimensions between the player and the game's world together. We are able to see the events of the story play out through our TV screens, whereas Callus is able to hear our voice and directly communicate with us. He, as well as other characters, will typically ask us for advice as to what to do in important moments. I know this kind of seems like a small thing, and mechanically it is, but if you can suspend your disbelief and accept the game's premise here, it does an awesome job of including the player in the story without having any stupid, out-of-place OCs taking any of the spotlight away from the characters in the world. It's incredibly immersive. What's more is that this scene is actually hugely important narratively. I won't go into specifics here, but this scene actually gives you all of the information you need to solve one of the game's biggest mysteries before it's even introduced. But of course, if you're just playing through the game casually, you won't be thinking about the implications of a character naming screen, so the payoff won't be spoiled. Anyways, once this scene is finished, we get some flashback stuff that gives us some hints as to Callus' motivations, and then we see Callus waking up. He was apparently attacked by some monsters and brought back to this village, Sebelrai, to get patched up by the town's doctor, Larakush. Callus then meets a woman named Shella, who alongside some friends of hers heads off to the nearby forest. With nothing really on Callus' schedule for the day, he decides to head into the forest as well, and soon finds Shella again under attack by a huge monster. They slay the beast, but unfortunately for Shella, her friends weren't lucky enough to survive. Here's where we get a pretty interesting bit of character setup. Callus immediately starts rummaging through the belongings of the two. Shella tries to give Callus the benefit of the doubt, thinking it may be so she could have some keeps sakes from them, but he immediately breaks that delusion by saying it's just her fair share of the loot, like he's some sort of RPG character. So yeah, our protagonist, the character we as players are effectively soul bonded to, does pretty much everything he can to be entirely unlikable here. He's selfish, short-sighted, uncaring, and just all around horrible to Shella. What's more interesting is that he kind of stays this way for a huge portion of the game. It's not like he got off on the wrong foot or was having a bad day, he truly is a selfish, cowardly, opportunistic guy who's looking out for number one, and is not really interested in doing the whole adventure for the greater good thing that most RPG heroes embark on. This actually puts us in a pretty interesting position, and I think it does a really good job of trying to make the player act as Callus's conscience. We are bonded to him and he wants to trust our guidance, so we may as well try to nudge him into the right direction as often as possible. Now you can indulge in Callus's whims whenever you like, but that does have some negative effects on your experience later on. Anyways, Callus and Shella begrudgingly join forces as they both have the same destination. Once they make their way to a secluded spring deep within the forest, Shella's necklace lights up and a huge monster attacks. Upon defeating it, a strange card known as a Magnus appears from the spring. Callus picks it up, causing the earth to shake. Before they can really understand what's going on, the area is raided by a battleship and the card, as well as Shella, are both taken by the leader, named Giacomo, who we saw in Callus's flashback killing one what seemed to be Callus's family. Callus obviously wants payback, but is KO'd before he's able to do anything. Upon waking up, feeling somewhat responsible for Shella's situation, Callus decides to rescue her by chasing down the airship she was abducted in, which leads him to the Lord's estate. Callus manages to save Shella and at the same time confronts Giacomo, who handily defeats them. Now at this point, Callus and Shella are enemies of the Empire since they, you know, assaulted one of their generals, and they have to flee by hopping on a ship and making their way Way to a nearby kingdom, Diadem. And I think it's about time I go over how this world is set up. The world of Batten Kaidos consists of a set of giant floating islands in the sky, each with its own kingdom. Throughout the first almost half of the game, we'll be traveling from island to island, which establishes that island's culture, people, and role in the world. Because of this, I'm going to rapid fire through most of these to get our cast and everything else set up. The first island we visited was Sedal Sud, led by Rodolfo. He has allied himself with Geldablame, leader of Alfard, 
Empire of the Flame, who is super not happy with Callus and Shella right now. Although mostly Shella, as she stole her pendant from him, which she's now using to search for the Shining Magnus. After leaving Sadal Sud, Callus and Shella make their way to Diadem, Land of Clouds. They pretty much immediately meet Gabari, an experienced fisherman and wisecracker, who's got a much deeper history than he's willing to divulge. He offers to take Callus and Shella to the city, which they find under siege by Alfard. Also in Diadem, the party meets Liud, an Imperial soldier who has been stationed in Diadem as an ambassador in disgrace. Upon seeing the siege and seeing what the Empire is willing to do to get what it wants, Liud takes a stand and defects, also joining up with Kallus' motley crew. The party helps clear the siege and are guided to the next Shining Magnus, known as End Magnus by King Ladakan. Unfortunately, they lose this Magnus as well due to mind control? And with nothing to show but knowing where they need to go next, they head to the next kingdom, Anue Nue, the Rainbow Nation. Not a lot happens here, honestly. The party gains a fifth member, Savina, another Imperial defector, and they manage to actually get their hands on the end Magnus for once. But despite the obvious threat by the Empire, Inoue Inoue's queen doesn't feel like doing anything about it, and in fact had just been hosting Geldeblame as a guest. That meeting goes about as well as you'd expect. So with one end Magnus in hand and two left to find, the team heads off to the easiest of the two to find, Mira, City of Illusion. On their way there, they meet the Great Mizuti, who will join the party after they reach the island. And now that we're in Mira, I'm gonna change gears for a bit, mostly because this is the best place to start talking about the game's visuals, as they are incredible here. So, as we know, Baton Kaidos uses pre-rendered images for all of its backgrounds, and they look incredibly good pretty much everywhere. From Diadem's gorgeous flowing clouds, to Inoue Nue's lush vegetation, to Alfard's dute-focused architecture, it's all great. But Mira? Mira is one of my favorite locations in all of media because of how well they use the pre-rendered backgrounds, and more specifically, how far they lean into them artistically, since this island is in constant shift between dimensions. Obviously, Parnass, the confectionery village, is beautiful, a town made of chocolate, candy, and icing. But other places in Mira are just as incredible, if not more so. Detourn is a strange garden that goes from regular Baton Kaitos to a full-on reference to Tower of Druaga at a moment's notice. Kokolith is a mirror maze that requires looking at the areas from several different angles to properly navigate. And oh man, reverence the picture book village. Just look at it! This sort of thing would end up being used later on in a bunch of indie games like Eeb, but I don't think I think I've seen any game do this before Baton Kaidos. It's so amazing. Now, the pre-rendered visuals do have some downsides. You can't really do much in terms of cinematography or camera moves with them, and that can lead to some cutscenes being a little more flat than they would have been otherwise. But for what Baton Kaidos is trying to do, I think it works perfectly fine. That being said, this is one major weakness of the remasters. Since properly scaling this 4x3 image to 16x9 would effectively require redrawing many backgrounds, some images just do the thing where they double the image in the background and blur it to fill the blank space. It doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's very noticeable. Other visuals like character models and stuff are fine, but one thing that has always bugged me about this game are the character portraits when speaking. Some of them are fine, but others are just abruptly cut off to meet some arbitrary size, and that sucks. This is something I wish the remaster would have changed, but oh well. It's not a big deal, but I don't like having these portraits cut when it really doesn't add anything. We're in dialogue, what's happening elsewhere on screen? is mostly inconsequential. On the audio side of things, we've got a few elephants stomping around in the room to address, and boy are they stomping, but first we'll go over the music. So the soundtrack was composed by Motoi Sakuraba, who even back in 2003 was a veteran in the game industry, and his work here is fantastic. Area tracks like Bellflower, Heaven Sea Flower Temple are really great, fitting each area really well, but what's more interesting are the battle tracks. The True Mirror is a fantastic battle track that even has a few variants throughout the game.
but my favorite is easily one of the most unique and strange battle tracks I've ever heard in a game like this, Chaotic Dance. This is Giacomo's battle theme, and there's nothing else like it in the entire game. It really makes his, as well as the battles with his underlings, stand out as true events, and are among the most memorable, which I don't really think they would have been if not for this song. And speaking of memorable, I think it's about time we address the biggest elephant in the room, the voice acting, because it is interesting to say the least. When it comes to voice acting in games, the early 2000s were basically the Wild West, especially for games produced in Japan that needed English localization, but there were a few games that were handled particularly strangely. Shenmue, for instance, was a massive game that was localized for English entirely within Japan. There were only a few people who were able to do that job, since they wanted local actors that were effectively fluent in both English and Japanese, and were willing to do voice acting with the amount of pre-production and proper direction that the job warranted back then, which was basically none. Unfortunately, that resulted in the finished product being rather awkward and shoddy. Where are you going? You're not going after them. Please don't. Now, I bring up Shenmue because Batten Kaidos' localization was done pretty much the exact same way. In fact, there's actually a ton of overlap of voice actors between the two games, and the few who weren't involved in Shenmue likely got their debuts here. Now, I wanted to give that bit of context here because I really don't want to rag on the voice actors themselves. Their job was seen as pretty unimportant back then and were very likely not given the time or preparation they needed to properly portray their roles. With that said, some of the performances given here are genuinely terrible, like immersion-breakingly bad. I do like some of them, I think Gibari's voice is pretty good all the way through and Mizuti is the best, but there are others that are just so wooden, so lacking in any emotion or awareness of the story beats that their entire characters kind of fall apart. It's not even like the script is bad, that side of localization had improved a bunch by 2003, it's just the voice actors not being able to bring that script to life. But call it nostalgia or a guilty pleasure or whatever, but when the remasters were announced and it was made public that the English voice acting was gone, I was pretty bummed out. Yes, it was largely terrible, but just like the Shenmue's of the world, that awkwardness, the stilted delivery, those inappropriate reactions, they've got a charm to them that is really unique to that era and I kinda like it. Oh hey, there's the asterisk back. I'm not against playing games in the original languages with subtitles if need be, but in the dub versus sub debate, I'll take a dub any day of the week. So using some sort of magic, I got my copy of the remaster here and put the English voices back so I could have the best of both worlds. The original artistic experience with the mechanical improvements of the remasters. And while yes, in some ways this is objectively inferior, they did make some incredibly minor changes to the script, probably to justify the removal of the English VA, subjectively these performances are a part of the experience and is worse off without them. Just as a side note here, the original voice acting has this really low quality tinny sound to them. I always thought this was an artistic decision to sort of simulate the distance between dimensions, but when I moved this audio to the new game, that was gone. So I guess it was just a bug. But of course, as integral as the presentation is to the story of Batten Kaidos, what really makes the game shine in my eyes is the gameplay. Now, I would go directly into talking about that, but there's one more thing that needs to be explained a bit first. The most interesting thing about the world of Batten Kaidos, and something foundational to basically everything you do in the game, Magnus. Magnus are cards that contain the essence of something. I know that's a really vague description, but what Magnus is and what it can do is incredibly broad, so a vague description does kind of work. Now, what do I mean by containing an essence? If you say, take a blank Magnus card and trap the essence of green bananas in it, that card will then hold the bananas inside it. But it's not like a representation or the concept of a banana or anything metaphysical like that. It contains an actual fruit that just happens to be stored in the form of a card. And it's not in any sort of stasis either, like Pokemon stored in boxes. Items stored in Magnus are still subject to the flow of time and will age. So those green bananas that were stored in a 
Magnus. After enough time, they will ripen, get a bit too ripe, and eventually rot. The same thing happens with most Magnus you can find. Wheat will ferment into beer, milk will age into cheese, etc, etc. It takes these cards, which could have been a very static surface level feature, and adds a really cool twist that makes them feel far more alive and integral to the world. What's more is that the time that these Magnus take to age are all unique, and occur in real time, not any sort of in-game sped up time. While this is really cool conceptually, it adds an enormous headache for anyone who wants to collect all the Magnus that the game has to offer. There are well over 1,000 Magnus to collect, many of which can't be found at all by exploring, and have to be either created via recipes, which I'll get into in a bit, or have to be aged into. Batankaidos is infamous for having one of the longest and most tedious 100% speedruns ever because of this, or just completions in general. One Magnus, the shampoo, needs to be aged into, and it takes, and I'm not joking at all here, 336 hours. Real time. Needless to say, I didn't go for 100% in either of my playthroughs here. I did, however, try my best to complete most of the game's main side quests, so let's talk about how it handles those, as well as the game's overall structure, since they are somewhat related. So, Batankaidos really isn't a game where the average player can do all of the side quests as they travel the world, or rather, it's very difficult and frustrating to attempt them without following a guide. There are a few side quests you can get early on that have clear goals, like Kuzman's Family Tree and the Constellation Gathering quests, which are lengthy, game-spanning quests that you can largely fill out as you go throughout the main story. They each give pretty decent rewards for completing them, but beyond the rewards, I just like how they end. Gathering all of Kuzman's family together results in the entire group having a dance party, and finding all of the constellations will fill out the star map, revealing that in this world, the North Star is the center star in the constellation of Cetus, Batankaidos. But for the majority of quests and the vast majority of players, all of these side quests are going to be something you do near the very end. The biggest reason for this is how it handles the inventory of quest critical items. See, in most games you'll have your regular inventory for things like equipment, consumables, and the like. These inventories are often limited, and that makes perfect sense. It makes the player engage with how they gather and store resources rather than just allowing one person with a backpack to carry several metric tons of weight without any thought. Conversely though, most games will typically separate important story-related quest items in an inventory that effectively has no limit, purely out of convenience for the player. Player. Making a player constantly juggle an ever-growing list of important items they can't throw away or use with their limited inventory space would be frustrating at best, so most games have the good sense to keep that separate, which typically leads to a much smoother experience. Bat and Kytos is the complete inverse of that. The regular inventory of Magnus is effectively infinite. There are technically a limit of 1,000, but you'll have to try really hard to fill that up. Important quest Magnus, however, are stored separately, and you have an incredibly limited number of blank Magnus you can use for this. At the start of the game you get like five blank Magnus cards to hold all of your quest items and that stays fairly static throughout the game. Keep in mind that Kuzman's family tree for his quest is held in one of these, as well as the warrior's mementos that you get from Shella's fallen friends, neither of which you'll want to throw away. If you hadn't already guessed, quest Magnus can and will age as well, and some, like the warrior's mementos, need to take up a quest slot for 40 hours in order for it to age into its final form and if you get rid of it or use it too soon, bye-bye 100%. On the other hand, if you needed a specific card for a quest, but took a little bit too long exploring, battling, or going through dungeons, it may have aged into something entirely useless for the quest you needed it for. If that happens, and it has happened to me, that could mean minutes, if not hours of time spent preparing that Magnus for the quest is just wasted, and you'd need to start again from scratch. Now, pretty much all of these issues could have at least been mitigated if there was any sort of quest log, but Batankaidos unfortunately lacks one. Even the remaster, which does add a ton of new quality of life changes, neglected to add one, which is a bummer. All these things add together in just the wrong ways to make doing side quests not very fun, so I end up putting them all off and progressing the main story instead, which leads directly into the game's overall structure and layout. So like I said earlier, the first half or so of the game has the party go from island to island to establish those lands and build out the cast, while slowly moving the story 
story forward. It's really linear, a lot more linear than I'd like, especially since you can't return to any previous islands once you've left them, meaning any collection or side quests you weren't able to complete are effectively locked out once you move on. There is a bit of a reprieve about 20 to 25 hours in where you are able to travel between the different islands of your own free will, but for reasons I'll go into later, it doesn't quite feel like the calm break where you're able to explore and do side questing that it sort of is. From that point, it's back on the railroad for another 8 hours or so until finally, in the game's final act, things completely open up and you're free to explore around the entire world however you like. Just another side note here, the game finally giving you freedom to explore around like you would in the final act is great, but when it yanks it away from you immediately after, oh, it's rough and it makes the latter half of the game feel a lot more restrictive than it already is. I don't really know why they did this, the story really wouldn't have suffered if we were just allowed to explore around, and it would have made the experience of doing side quests and just exploring around so much more fun. On the subject of the world, one thing that pretty much every good RPG has are fun, interesting places and dungeons, and Baton Kaidos definitely has some good ones here. Since the game is using pre-rendered visuals to construct its areas, they're not going to be huge, sprawling worlds in their own right. Each place is made up of one or more screens that you can explore. Most towns are pretty small, but are designed with so much personality that they all stand out from each other. When it comes to dungeons, I wouldn't go so far as to say that they're amazing, or that any of them are the best I've ever seen. Monolith has definitely topped pretty much everything here in the Xenoblade series, but they definitely get the job done and Monolith did do a good job of making the major ones unique and interesting in their own ways. Obviously the two main Mira ones, Cocolith and Deturn, are among the best, Deturn specifically, but even outside the creativity explosion that is Mira, there's some good ones. You'll be doing things like gathering guards to deploy in Diadem's castle to fight off the siege, trying to navigate an area constantly roadblocked by Australian insects, or climbing up a tower entirely by some solving Zelda block pushing puzzles, which ends in a Qbert reference. What I particularly love about the dungeons in this game though, is that they never really overstay their welcome. I've played so many games where the dungeons are just outrageously long, where you can spend multiple play sessions and not even complete them, but Baton Kaidos thankfully exercises restraint here and keeps its dungeons manageable. Outside of the final dungeon, which is perfectly justified in being fairly long, most of the actual dungeons in Baton Kaidos rarely exceed two hours for me. Most being closer to one, and that immensely helped in keeping the game's pacing relatively quick. But even here in the dungeons, the limited quest magnus ends up being an issue. There are three dungeons with mechanics where you'll need to have several of a specific magnus, and if you're full up on other stuff, they're either significantly more tedious than they would be otherwise, or in the case of Nihal Desert, actually impossible. It's really interesting how this one little design decision would end up having so much of an effect on different parts of the game. And now it's about time to start talking about my absolute absolute favorite thing about this game, the battle system. Just like everything else, this relies heavily on Magnus, and just like grapes age into a fine wine, I've only come to appreciate this game's battles more and more over time. Alright, this battle system is incredibly complex, so we're going to take things slow here to properly go over it, but it's the kind of complexity that falls into place incredibly smoothly once you understand all of its moving parts. And the foundation of these parts are Magnus, and specifically the decks of Magnus you need to build for your characters. So, before you even enter a battle, you need to understand that all the actions your character can do in battle are determined by the cards that fill that character's deck. That includes attacking, defending, healing, everything. You can't even run away from battles without having the card that specifically allows you to do so. Since everything you do revolves around these cards, how you build each character's decks largely determines how well you'll be able to handle enemies big and small. These Magnus are split into a few different types. Weapon cards are mostly used for attacking and are typically character specific. For instance, Kallus uses swords because he has a sword, so you can't give him any of Liud's Dewtorns and have them do anything. Armor cards are used exclusively for defending and how they're split up is a little bit more arbitrary. It's sort of split up by gender, but kinda not. Big manly men like Kallus, Kabari, and Liud get to wear big strong armor, also Savina sometimes. And the women, Shella and Savina, get more fashionable equipment like hats, but also Mizuti. Then there are item cards, which is a large group that pretty much has everything else from healing items, status effect cards, or utility cards like the aforementioned escape. Each of these cards have a bunch of different attributes which determine what they can do and how 
how they can be used, but what's most important for deck building are their elements. Eternal Wings has a really interesting element system, and properly building around those elements can largely determine how difficult the game will be for you. There are six different elements that cards can have, light, dark, water, fire, wind, and chronos, each of which forming pairs that can counteract each other. Don't ask me how chronos is the opposite of wind, because I have no idea. Anyways, certain cards will have these elements, and how you use them determines how strong your attacks will end up. Sure, you can throw all six elements onto any one character and just toss out random cards with high attack power, but if those cards end up being opposing elements, you won't get the most out of your turn. For instance, and I am completely ignoring the fact that most cards have physical damage completely separate from any element interaction here, if you do 400 water damage and 360 fire damage in a single turn, you'd end up actually doing 40 damage total. In fact, it's worse than that. If you planned things out, more only used water on turn 1 and then used the fire on turn 2, you'd be doing 760 damage total over 2 turns. It works out this way because all damage calculations between the elements happen in that turn and aren't carried over to the battle as a whole. Now conversely, when you're defending from enemy attacks, you want to use elements that counteract theirs since it will reduce the amount of elemental damage they do to you. The same element cancelling effect will happen if you play opposing cards. But unlike when building your attacking core, you'll probably want to have a large variety of elements in armor, so you're never in a position where a strong enemy or boss can hit you with everything they've got forever and there's nothing you can do about it. It's these sorts of things that you need to be planning for and building your decks around. Kalos, Shella, Gabari, and Mizuti all have access to all six elements for their attacks, but their effectiveness in battle will be decimated if you don't whittle their decks down and focus on complementary elements. For example, during my most recent playthrough, I used both Shella and Mizuti in my active party for a while. Shella had water, light, and wind magic, and Mizuti got the fire, dark, and chronos stuff. That way, no matter what, even accounting for elemental resistances and stuff, which enemies and bosses do have, I was never actively harming myself by forcing my party into a situation where they'd have to use conflicting elements or reduce their overall card output. This is a much harder thing for Liud and Savina to do, as they only ever have access to two elements, light and dark for Liud, water and fire for Savina. It's not impossible to to build these characters, but since they're so limited, they're definitely much harder characters to use. Now, this is a lot of stuff to consider, and with the amount of cards you'll be finding throughout the world and getting as rewards from battles, I can definitely see this as being fairly tedious and time-consuming for a lot of people, if you aren't into building decks as much as I am. I personally have a ton of fun with this and think it supplements the actual battles incredibly well, but not everyone thinks like I do, and in the remaster, Bamco has added a few quality of life changes to make building decks easier easier and faster. I think the most important changes here are the more robust filtering that lets you quickly find the strongest Magnus for any character at the press of a button, which makes building decks quite a bit faster than it would be otherwise. Another change that I like was how they more obviously separated consumable item Magnus, like items to heal your team outside of battles, and equipment Magnus, which all kind of got buried amongst the pile in the original. This makes using consumables and changing out accessories so much more convenient and less confusing than it was originally. Now the last thing I wanted to talk talk about before we actually enter battles is the game's leveling system, because it's pretty weird, but kinda cool. So, most games will give out experience upon defeating enemies, and once you get enough of that, you'll level up, which comes with higher stats, possibly better moves, and a new, higher experience goal to reach. The only thing that Baton Kaidos does automatically this way is handing out the experience. The rest is up to the player. Out in the world, you'll see these blue flowers, which act as the game's save points, but you can also enter the church this way. One thing you can do here is give constellations to the guy for his quest, but more importantly, you can talk to this guy and using your gained experience, level up your characters. What's more unique about this system is that not every flower in the world is a blue one. Typically, all the flowers you find in any dungeon area are orange, which lets you save, but that's it. This let the developers balance out areas a bit more easily than they normally would, since they can effectively guess what level the party should be at at that point, and balance all enemies around that level to give a good difficulty curve for the area. The player should be able to fight enemies at the beginning of the area relatively easily, then have a decently challenging boss, and Baton Kaidos typically does that really well. But the system actually does benefit the player in the long run as well. While you could, after every single level, go to the church and level up, what is much more likely to happen is that you'll effectively stockpile levels that will be all gained at once. When you level up this way, each level beyond the first gets an extra boost to the stats you gain. Because of this, if you truly want
want to be the strongest you can at the end of the game, the best way to do this is to only level up once you've stockpiled 10 levels, as the extra boosts only go up to that. Now, people who have only played the GameCube original may have never known this was a thing. It was always there, just invisible. But the remaster actually shows the values your stats will increase by when leveling up multiple times. Oh, you can also class up your characters here using specific items found throughout the world. This increases the amount of cards in their hand within battles, as well as increasing the total amount of cards they can have in their decks. Now, you may have guessed that since leveling up is entirely optional, the game has to be built to facilitate people who are crazy enough to try to go through the entire game at base levels, and it is. The remaster even includes a new game minus mode, which lets people play through the game a second time while locked to the base levels and unable to ever level up. It's a pretty hardcore challenge mode, but thankfully, this battle system is versatile enough to let that happen. And with that, let's actually start talking about how the battles are set up and play out. At the start of a battle, Callus will draw a set of cards from his deck. These will be the options he'll have this turn. Beyond that, you'll see the combo max number on the side, which tells you the amount of cards you can use, and the initial time, which just shows you how long you have to start your turn before forcibly passing. This thankfully starts with no limit, letting you take in everything that's going on and not get too overwhelmed since it's already a lot. This drops down to like 5 seconds by the end of the game, but by then you'll hopefully have your brain wired to properly destroy anything that comes your way. Attacking Magnus have damage values, Armor Magnus have defense values, and many of them have prerequisites that need to be met before they can be properly played. For instance, most Armor Magnus can't be used during your turn and will instantly fail your combo if you even try. Likewise, many attacking Magnus don't have defense stats and won't do anything if they are used to defend. Other cards have certain combo requirements and can't be used until a certain combo level is met. All of the finisher moves each character gets are like this. They have a minimum card combo that needs to be met before they can be played. The earliest of them goes as low as 2, and the strongest at the end of the game goes as high as 7, meaning you need to have played at least 6 cards before that one can be activated. That brings me to my first criticism about the game's combat, and specifically the remaster's UI. Despite the fact that all card combo requirements are in ascending order, the card combo tracker in the UI descends. I feel like the general conveyance of card combos would come across much better if that had worked the same way. Start at say 0 of 3, going up to 1 after the first card, 2 after the second, and so on. While as it is, it's very basic mental math to determine combo length, it's the sort of thing that can be very easy to trick yourself up on during these intense battles, especially when the timer starts very low. Another thing that can trip you up are healing Magnus and how targeting works in this game. So at the start of your turn, you target whoever you want, be that enemy or ally. Once you start playing cards, however, you can't change your target. So if you're attacking an enemy and accidentally throw a healing item at it, well, too bad, you just healed it. There's no guardrails here. If you screw up, you screw up. This definitely can be a bit punishing if you're not paying attention, but honestly, I think it's fine. You need to be playing cards deliberately, not just tapping A over and over to try to make a battle go by faster because that won't work. Now, speaking of punishing, one of the most important and most intensive things you'll want to be doing in battles involves the numbers on the cards here. So the numbers which range from one to nine make up the game's prize system. It works kind of like poker, where you'll want to play card numbers that'll make up pairs, straights, full houses, things like that, which if done properly will add bonus damage to your attacks or further reduce damage done to you. It starts out fairly simple, especially since most cards early on will only have one number, meaning long card strings are simply out of the picture. But as time goes on, the amount of cards you have access to and the amount of numbers on those cards increases, it gets far more complex and you'll need to plan out your turns far more if you actually want to do the most damage. An important aspect of the prize system is the fact that a single card out of place entirely destroys all possible prize effects. If you, say, have three pairs of two cards, which would normally increase damage by about 40%, but play a seventh card which is different from anything else you've played, sure, you'll get the extra damage from that one card, but you'll forfeit the entire prize bonus, resulting in far lower damage than you would have had otherwise. Because of this, it's important to know when not to play cards. This in particular is really tough, as it's 
always tempting to just play more cards for more damage, but way more often it'll be more advantageous to play fewer cards that give higher prize bonuses than it would be to just toss out everything you have and hope it works. And because prizes are such an important mechanic, I would heavily recommend new players not use the A button to choose cards at all. To choose numbers beyond the first, you will need to use the right stick, and getting used to that early, even when there's only one number to choose from, will make the transition so much smoother. I wish someone had told me that back in 2004. I didn't even realize I could choose the other numbers until like halfway through the game the first time. On the topic of the right stick, another thing that makes prizes harder to get are the game's status effects, Dizzy and Headache, and this is another slight criticism I have with the system. Not that it's bad, but mostly because of how one of them was implemented. Dizzy makes sense, the numbers on the card start spinning around and makes choosing the right number way harder. It works as a negative status effect that you'd want to cure. But Headache is the complete opposite. The way the numbers are normally set up, where they're in the corners, creates some inherent uncertainty as to which direction to press to choose those cards. Do you press up or right to choose the top right number? I don't know, just maybe guess and hope it works. What Headache does is rotates the numbers on the cards about 45 degrees to the cardinals. This is so much easier. I don't know why they didn't do this by default and have the diagonal be the negative effect. It would make everything about the prize system click so much quicker for players. Anyways, if you pay attention to all of this, build your deck with good synergistic cards, properly pay attention to elements when attacking enemies, use the card numbers to build up a huge prize bonus, and end your turn on a powerful special attack, the amount of damage you can do in a single turn can be straight up ridiculous. Like a third or more of the final boss's HP all at once sort of powerful. You also need to keep track of your and Callus's relationship to maximize your damage. Remember the little story choices that you get throughout the game where you hopefully try to make Callus less of a jerkwad? Well, here's where they actually start to matter. Yeah, during the story, what you say won't really change any of the outcomes, but like Callus said, whether or not he trusts you determines how strong he can get, and spirit finishers are what happens if the bond is strong enough. They kind of work like finishing moves, but they can only be played at the end of a card combo, and are incredibly strong, stronger than most other cards you can get. The only real downside is that the element you get is random, so you may not necessarily want to use them every time they show up. But they end up being a really useful option in battles if you say the right stuff and try your best to keep him on track. So maybe be nice to Callus every once in a while. Man, I absolutely love this system, pretty much all of it. It's also strategic, so well thought out for the most part at least, and especially later on, when the time you have to plan out your turns gets shorter and shorter, really fast paced and frantic. It's immensely satisfying to be able to land a huge prize bonus on a strong enemy and just obliterate them in a single turn, and it's also just as satisfying to be up against a strong boss, one that could easily demolish you, and through proper card choices and planning, entirely negate all the damage they do to you. And there's even some really goofy stuff you can pull off with this system as well. I specifically love using the voice Magnus, not because they're good, but because they're funny. What they do is just give a flat prize bonus to all damage at the end of turn, while having your characters mercilessly taunt the enemy. They're normally not that good, but I just love using them at the end of a card combo, especially one that kills an enemy because after you slice them up, the enemy is still just standing there. They only die after you roast them, and I just love the idea of Callus and his crew going around insulting people to death, it's great. Come and get me! I especially love doing that to bosses, although it is quite a bit more difficult to pull that off. On the subject of bosses, they are one of the most divisive things in the game for me. Overall, I do really like them, they typically got pretty fun gimmicks, require unique strategies to beat them, and all offer a fair challenge that almost never comes across as unfair. But on the other hand, the bosses in this game do shine a light on what I consider to be the battle system's biggest and most obvious flaw. So most bosses are a single enemy versus a party of three characters. This doesn't seem like it'd cause much of an issue, but over time, as cards get played, something really unfortunate can happen. Let's say this boss is a huge jerk and just hates one character for some reason. That character will get a healthy amount of card draw and use by unloading their attacking Magnus during their turns and blocking a good amount of attacks during the opponents. Eventually, they'll run out of cards, spend a turn shuffling their deck, and start again fresh. But what happens to the other two characters who don't get that level of card refresh? They get to do nothing because there's no way to discard any cards you don't want. 
So, in this situation, the other two characters will quickly exhaust all of the attacking Magnus they have available, and be left with a bunch of healing or armor cards that are entirely useless. On their turns, they just have to use an armor card that does nothing, end their turn, and just hope that the boss decides to target them for once. If this doesn't happen, and it may not happen for a long time, those characters are just dead weight, and the fight becomes a 1v1 for a while, which the one character left is likely not to succeed in. This this can be catastrophic, but thankfully it really only happens in single enemy bosses and mostly during the early mid game when revival cards are exceedingly rare. And that actually leads me directly into something else that I'm not a huge fan of, the card recipes. So, like I said earlier, there are well over a thousand Magnus to be found throughout the game. Many can be picked up during your travels or have to be aged into, but the rest need to be created in battle with special combos. There are over 140 of these combos, and while some of them are fairly simple, like using beef, then fire to create some sort of cooked meat, and some others, like the aforementioned revival card, the Holy Grail can be sort of found out naturally while playing by using two very unique cards together. There are some others which are absurd and you'll basically need a guide to ever make them. They're not like random or anything, but a lot of them sure feel that way. What does lukewarm wine, roasted squid, a painting, and light magic get you? A boat, obviously, and in case you were wondering, if you were to play any other cards during your turn in this combo, it would fail and you wouldn't get the resulting Magnus. I didn't bother with most of these, the few I did use to ultimately create the Sacred Wine, the best revival card in the game, didn't take a lot of work, and the time I did spend on them was well worth the reward. So overall, while I do have some major criticisms here, wrong situations during bosses can be ruinous to the experience, and things like special combos and recipes work against the system and make collection even more tedious than it already is, but I do absolutely adore this battle system. The amount of player expression allotted from the deck building is immense, and you can effectively build any character however you want every single time you play, and it's just so much fun to engage with. Every battle is different, offers up different options, different ways to tackle any situation, different challenges. They really just need to refine things a little bit, allow for discarding, or program bosses to not not target the same party member more than a few times in a row, and it'd probably break my top 5 favorite systems. As it is, it's not quite there, but it is very close and I had an absolute blast with it. With all that out of the way, I think it's about time we start heading back towards the story, and you know the drill. There's a timestamp if you want to skip any spoilers, although I'd probably just recommend playing through the game and coming back over skipping because there is a ton of stuff we need to talk about. Anyways, let's go. So, where we left off, the party was in possession of one End Magnus, the other two they had gained being taken away from them immediately afterwards. Once reaching Mira, the first town they visit is Parnass, and Callus helps a girl who had fallen up. This girl is Melodia, granddaughter of the Duke of Mira, and after some time exploring an 8-bit video game, we learn that she had been kidnapped. With no other suspects, Callus and co are kept prisoner, only to escape after Gabari takes one for the team and eats his way through a candy wall. I'm getting heartburn just thinking about that. The team finds Melodia in Necton, the Shrine of Spirits, held by Giacomo and his goons, but before a fight can break out, a giant monster escapes from the place between dimensions. Melodia is actually the one to defeat the creature, convincing it to somehow return to where it belongs. Having rescued Melodia, the team's names are cleared, and they are free to travel further around the island, but disaster strikes. Callus seems to have lost their end Magnus somehow. This triggers a huge loss of trust within the party, as the logical thought is that someone stole it from Callus during the struggle. Unfortunately for them though, there's no time to try to weed out a traitor, and the team needs to stick together and head for Duke Halbrin's manor to find Mira's end Magnus. He acknowledges that the end Magnus is under his mansion, and eventually the team finds it, but it's snatched up by Giacomo before they are able to get their hands on it. With no other options at this point, the team decides to infiltrate the Empire to stop Geldoblame from getting his hands on the final end Magnus. Here, within the Empire, the most most important moments in the entire story occur, but before that, a warning for anyone playing the game, and especially GameCube players. The first major boss you encounter in the Empire is a fight against Giacomo and his goons, and this is typically seen as one of the biggest difficulty spikes in the game, and even in general, honestly. If you aren't prepared, you are just entirely screwed. What makes this section worse, though, is that it takes place in a small dungeon area that you can't leave once you save. Also, 
remember that dungeon areas don't have blue flowers to level up with, so what you go in with is what you have until you leave. What makes this even worse for GameCube players in particular is that this area is immediately after the disc swap. So if, say, the game asked you to save your game upon swapping a disc, and you didn't have a secondary save from earlier in the game, you only have two choices. You break through Giacomo's wall, or give up and start again from scratch. This is pretty much unforgivable, something that in just the wrong situation is game-breakingly bad. Of course, the level your team is won't be the only deciding factor on whether you win or lose, but you can't even really farm for better cards here either. There's only one regular enemy type on this ship, so you can make Gibaria Beast with their drops, but you won't really be able to bolster the rest of your squad. Upon defeating Giacomo, Callus finally declares victory over his mortal enemy, the man who killed his grandfather and brother, when Giacomo drops a bombshell. He reveals that Georg, Callus's grandfather, is in fact Giacomo's father just before the ship explodes, likely leaving Giacomo dead. With that chapter closed, the team manages to track down Geldeblame in the lava caves, where the final end Magnus is held, only to find that he'd already freed it and is now in control of all five. He attempts to use the end Magnus himself and unleash the power of the dead god Malpertio, but something goes wrong and Geldeblame is distorted, corrupted into a horrible eldritch being. Upon unleashing this power, the dead god's castle, Kor Hydra, is also revealed from between the dimensions, a clear sign that the evil god will be returning. Geldeblame seems confused by all this, like this wasn't in his plans, but it turns out that his plans never mattered in the first place. Melodia arrives and reveals that reviving Malpertio was her plan all along, was using Geldeblame to further her own ambitions, and his new form is the result of the five end Magnus not being five parts of a single god, but five separate limbs from five separate gods. His distorted figure being a natural outcome of attempting to combine the powers of these five separate gods. After Geldeblame's demise, Melodia congratulates her partner and beckons them to come claim their reward for working with her. But who was her accomplice? Who was determined enough to have the world end that they'd be willing to help revive a dead god? Well, the answer has actually been in plain sight the entire time. It was Callus. This was a huge twist and was genuinely shocking. Like, how could the protagonist, our partner, be the bad guy? But if you really thought about it and were actually paying attention, Batankaidos actually foreshadows this incredibly well. Remember the very first scene of the game when you name your character? Well, the character talking to Callus here and suggesting he bond with the spirit is Melodia's voice. Moreover, you can even see her in that scene if you're looking closely. Now, obviously, no one will be looking that closely at the name selection screen, so I'm sure that many people playing had never noticed her before. Melodia's voice also comes through whenever a new End Magnus is released, strengthening the connection between Malpertio and her even before she makes her first appearance. And of course, of course, during that first meeting in Parnass, Callus didn't suddenly become more chivalrous when Melodia fell. They were both using that event as an excuse for him to hand off their one end Magnus without anyone knowing. So yeah, the minute you enter Parnass and meet Melodia, you literally have all the tools you need to not only understand who the main villain is or what their goal is, but also know that Callus will eventually betray the team and join up with her. Amazing. Now, with his betrayal made known, Melodia gets Callus to correctly use the dead god's power, which grants him what he always wanted, two real beautiful wings. Callus was always bullied for only having one wing, and ever since his grandfather and brother were killed by Giacomo, he'd always considered himself weak, and was searching for the power he'd needed to avenge them and become the person he'd always dreamt of being. Melodia, using the temptation of Malpertio's power, was able to grant him both of those wishes, so it makes sense that he'd want to join up. Not needing this extra power anymore, Callus says goodbye to the player and banishes the spirit from his world. Of course, we won't give up on Callus, and neither will Shella, so she calls out, and by some miracle, we actually hear her voice which lets us bond with her, giving us another permanent window into their world for a while. And as such, we'll be controlling her in-game for the next few hours, and everything that applies to Callus still applies here. Remember the spirit finishers? Well, I was kind of lying when I said we had to make Callus trust us. The game doesn't 
doesn't just track how Callus feels towards the player, but Shella too. So if you are trying too hard to be on Callus' side in every situation, you may not be getting many of those in combat anymore. Anyways, this is the point I mentioned a while ago about getting some freedom to explore around, but considering how high the stakes just got raised and that the entire party has been routed, it's obviously not a huge amount of downtime. The goal here is to go from island to island, saving all of the captured team, who are kept in interdimensional rifts. Upon freeing them all, the team needs to regroup and figure out exactly what needs to be done next. Meeting with Queen Corellia, the team comes up with a plan. The only option they can try is a long shot gambit to meet with the Ice Witches of Wazin, the frozen nation that has refused contact with the others for centuries. The chances of this succeeding are pretty low, but there's no other choice, so they have to try. Upon reaching Wazin, they find the castle, but it's beyond reach. Or at least it seems that way until Shella releases some strange magic that bridges the gap between them and the city and stops the island's blizzard. After just casually changing the weather, she walks on into Cursa, the snowy city. It's here that we get another huge bombshell. Shella isn't some normal girl and her magical abilities are no normal occurrence. Shella is the queen of Wazin and she's been on a journey to stop Malpertio from the very beginning. Here in Wazin, Shella asks her guardian Barnett if there's anything that can be done to cure Callus of Malpertio's curse and free him from Melodia's control. Barnett suggests the ocean mirror and ancient relic held within the nation, but in order to get it, Shella will have to prove herself worthy to the goddess of ice. This is tied with another later on for being the worst boss fights in the game for two reasons, both being a result of the boss being entirely random. Unlike most fights, you get a hand of cards that are flipped upside down and you can't see what you choose. In order to damage the boss, all you need to do is pick the card that matches the one they chose. Not difficult by any means, but since you don't know what you're picking, you can just get unlucky over and over, which can result in you straight up dying by no fault of your own. What's worse though, is that just like every other boss, in order to get 100%, you need to take a photo of it. That's another one of those cards that can pop up randomly in your hand. If you get unlucky and miss the photo, you either have to restart the fight from a previous save point, or deal with the fact that you're not getting 100%. There's really nothing that can be done to fix these either, they're just kind of fundamentally broken, no fun, and random. Thankfully, it only happens twice, but it really shouldn't have happened at all. Anyways, with the ocean mirror in hand, the crew now need to once again infiltrate Alfard, now infested by infernal monsters from Core Hydra, breach the castle, then confront Callus and Melodia. After a pretty tough fight against Callus, Shella uses the ocean mirror, but it doesn't seem to work, and it seems like even this was all a part of Melodia's plans. She uses the bond of friendship between the five party members as a power source to fully revive Malpertio, and it seems like there's now no hope. However, Shella did actually get through to Callus, and using this moment of lucidity, takes his fate into his own hands, rips off the evil god's foul wing, and frees himself from Malpertio's grasp. Melodia, being entirely done with this gong show, is about to have Malpertio destroy everyone when Mizuti springs into action and calls upon some strange spirits that chant a magic spell that disrupts Malpertio, causing them to flee. The team escapes, and after some more flashbacks, Callus rejoins the world of the living. He doesn't to ask anyone to forgive him, but he does ask if they'll join him in defeating Malpertio once and for all. They all agree and decide on their next move. The magicians that Mizuti summoned, who helped fend off Malpertio and Alfard, are apparently people of the Earth, a group of wizards that no one above the clouds knew truly existed. But considering they do exist, and Mizuti is apparently one of them, they seem like the next place to visit, as their strong magic may be the weapon the world needs to fight Malpertio. So they get on their pet dragon, and and literally jump off into a bunch of poisonous clouds, just hoping to both survive the clouds and the fall. Thankfully, they are RPG protagonists, so they do, and they make their way to Gamma Village, Mizuti's hometown. Here, Callus, Kabari, and Liud all learn that Mizuti is actually a girl. This was pretty obvious to everyone else, but you know how it is. Talking to the village's leader, the team learns of the Sword of the Heavens, which was used to destroy Malpertio long ago. Unfortunately for the party, not everyone is actually on board with the whole fight Mal 
Malpertio plan, and this goof named Crumley decided to give the one thing that can kill Malpertio to Malpertio as a gift. To reach Crumley at the top of Zosma Tower, the team has to get past this boss, which historically has been the most difficult in the entire game for me. They hit insanely hard, do loads of elemental damage in particular, and if you aren't prepared, you're in for a bad time. It is a really well-designed boss, though. Once they go down, we do get to Crumley before he gives Melodia the sword, but unfortunately, just a few minutes later, during a fight against Malpertio, the sword is broken. This is a really fun fight, though, and I really hope everyone is using Mizuti for it. Mizuti normally wears a big mask to protect her from the poisonous gases of the taint clouds, but just before the fight, the mask is broken and she's heard normally for the first time. A really cool little detail is that in this fight, not only does Mizuti have a unique model to show her without her mask, but all of her voice lines are played without the filter and distortion as well. They didn't need to do that, they could have easily had Mizuti KO'd or something for that fight, but they took the time to program a special case for a single battle and I really appreciate that. In the aftermath of the battle with Malpertio on the surface, it seems like all hope may be lost. The Sword of the Heavens is broken, Core Hydra is fully fortified and sending out assaults to the other nations frequently, and it seems like there's nothing anyone can do. The leaders of the remaining islands have largely banded together to fend off Core Hydra's attacks, but they can only hold out for so long and something must be done, so the leaders must take some time to prepare a plan. In the meantime, Callus receives a letter from this chicken lady from Laracouche who wants to talk to Callus about his grandfather Georg and his past. So Callus and the rest of the team all head off for Sadal Sud to see what Laracouche has to say, despite Callus wanting to go alone. We know that Giacomo said that Callus' grandfather is his father, but that can't mean that Giacomo is Callus' dad, right? But what reason would Giacomo have to lie to Callus about that, and if he's telling the truth, what does that even mean for Callus' family? Heading back to Sablerai, Laracouche has been waiting for Callus' return to give him some answers to these burning questions. It turns out that Laracouche was a close personal friend and colleague of Georg, and knows exactly who, or rather what, Callus is. Callus is the result of Georg trying to create artificial life from Magnus. Giacomo isn't Callus' father because Callus doesn't have a true father, he's an artificial life form. The first successful one, at least. Callus' brother, Fee, was also one, and when Geldeblame ordered their execution, Georg and Laracouche took the kids from Alfard and fled. From there, they went their separate ways. Laracouche went to Sadal Sud to live in Sebelrai, while Georg, Callus, and Fee went to live in Mira until being found out and killed by Giacomo. Now, it seems like Georg was a nice guy who was doing everything he could to save the life of innocent kids, but a little later on, we learn that Georg wasn't as virtuous as Laracouche made it out to be. In the Celestial Alps, an uninhabited set of islands, the group is confronted by Giacomo, who is alive somehow, and his minions again. This is another one of my least favorite fights in the game, if only because it's done twice. Like, literally, you do the boss fight, then a cutscene plays, and then you do the boss fight again. It's not even like one is half health or anything, they're both full boss fights. I have no idea why they did this. Anyways, extraneous boss fight aside, upon defeating Giacomo for the last time, he truly does die. With his dying breaths, he asks Amy and Falon to join up with Callus to defeat Malpertio, which they reluctantly agree to, but they aren't happy about it, believe it or not. See, Georg actually performed experiments on both of them to make them capable of controlling Malpertio's power, stripping them of their ability to be regular people and effectively turning them into living weapons. They obviously resent Georg for that and see their role in killing him as entirely justified and good, considering the evil he subjected them to. He took away their lives, so they took his. This was definitely depth that these two needed, since prior to this point they were fairly one note and didn't have much to offer from a character point of view. But with this reunion finished, they leave and the party heads back to Inue Inue. And finally, it's at this point where the game finally opens up and we're allowed to explore the world as we like complete side quests we've missed, and even start tackling the character-specific quests that are now available. I feel like these are really good quests to do, but man, I wish some of them were available a lot earlier. Some of them, like Mizuti's, do make a lot of sense at the very end of the game, but others could have easily been done earlier if we were allowed to move freely sooner in the story. I guess the main reason to keep them locked to the end game was because they hold each character's final class up item, letting them hold a massive nine cards in their hand, but I don't know, I think they could have fudged it somehow. When the party gets back to Inue Inue, we're basically given a choice. 
We could go directly into the assault on Kor Hydra and try to finish the game without being fully prepared, or we could go and talk to the chicken lady. The chicken lady basically just tells us where we need to go to start all of the party's side quests, and I do recommend doing them, not only for the upgrades, but they do a ton to flesh out each character and complete their arcs. See, while I do enjoy all of the characters here, their interactions are fun, and they clearly do have a lot of depth that we do see throughout the experience, if you don't complete these quests, you won't fully understand who they are. None do this better than Savina's story, which is about her trying to atone for her previous actions. She was once an assassin for the Empire and was tasked with raising a rebellious city, Aza, the place where Amy and Falon were born, to the ground. Being an obedient soldier, she performed her duties perfectly, but upon actually seeing what she had done, she couldn't live with herself anymore and abandoned her life in the Empire. Upon returning to the town that she helped destroy, she has to work to try to atone for her deeds. Try to rebuild trust with people who have all the reason in the world to only ever hate her. I particularly like this one because Savina is normally very standoffish and not very emotive, so getting this backstory and arc does a lot to round her character out. Liu's quest actually has a similar starting point. As a member of a high-profile family, he was in Geldeblame's circles when the plans for the extermination of Aza were being set in motion. Liu did vocally oppose this plan, but he was too cowardly to actually do anything about about it. This is why he was exiled to Diadem, but things only got worse for him from there. Earlier in the game, during our first visit to Alfard, we meet Liud's adoptive mother, Almard, and his siblings. His siblings hate Liud for being alive and try to turn him into the Empire after his defection. Almard is actually killed in this altercation, and while the other two escape, it's implied that they too have died in the chaos since. This, as well as what happened in Aza, had been stewing within Liud, and the guilt he feels seems to have made itself manifest in the dimensions between Mira and the rest of the islands, as a ghost ship calling for his name has appeared. Exploring the ship, Liud has constant hallucinations of his family, as well as the people from the town that was destroyed, berating him, wishing he was never born, and blaming him for their deaths. Through this quest, he has to learn how to deal with his grief, and realize that the ones he loved would never blame him for what happened, and that he needs to be strong enough to move on towards the future. They aren't all super complex, though. Mizuti has to go and help some of her friends who had explored deep into the depths of Zazma to get Mizuti's final class up item from the ancient wizards. This has the other of the two random bosses, therefore it sucks. Similarly, Shella must tap into the ancient Wazen magic and gain the blessing of the old Wazen magicians for her class item. Her backstory is further explored during this quest as well, and I'm really happy it does this, since this quest is probably the least interesting one otherwise. And finally, Gibari just has to catch a big fish better than another guy to make the hot bartender lady like him. Obviously that's not all there is to it, there is a kid dying or whatever, but Gibari in particular is very light on backstory here. He's more well-rounded and more certain of who he is and what he's doing than everybody else, which is a fun trait for a character to have. He's having fun with life and he's here to help out anyone who needs it. He's like the true RPG protagonist of the group. Once all the side quests are accounted for, it's finally time to end this and head into Core Hydra to finish off Malpertio once and for all. To do this, each island's leader uses their island's energy to blast away at Core Hydra's barrier with the hopes of breaking it so the party can infiltrate. Unfortunately, they needed all of the main islands to contribute, and with the Empire lacking a leader, there seems to be no one who can use that energy. But that's where Amy and Falone come in. The experiments Georg did made them capable of using the energy of the island, and with their help, they're able to break the barrier away, letting the team in. And and here we are in the final dungeon, and like I said, this is a very long stretch of the game. Most dungeons would be between 1 and 2 hours, but this one took me a whopping 4 hours to get through, including the ending. We first need to defeat all 5 of the ancient gods that were woken alongside Kor Hydra, which are all decent enough bosses. They all look the same, but they all use different elements, meaning you'll need to change up your setup for each one. Or at least, hope you are prepared for it. It's a straight guess with the first one, but you're more likely to make the right choice as more of them go down. Once they're done, it's time to head up and confront Malpertio, whose battle goes by pretty easily. Having seemingly defeated Malpertio, the leaders of the islands join the team in Core Hydra to confront Melodia. We learn her backstory here from Duke Calbrin. It turns out that at a young age, she, along with her mother and father, both perished due to a plague. Compelled by grief, Duke Calbrin used the power of the End Magnus to bring Melodia back to life, which explains all of her actions. From the beginning, she was a being 
guided by Malpercio's influence, her very existence depending on his power, so she worked to revive the evil god. In her anger over learning this, she fuses with Malpercio, letting him assume his true form, which is the game's ultimate battle. This fight can be absolutely brutal. He does absurdly high damage, can toss out up to like 10 cards in a single turn, and since he's a single enemy fight, you can get into that worst case scenario where one party member just gets pulped while the others just have to stand there and watch. But honestly, I really do like it. It's really tough and you need to be playing at your peak for the entire time, but it's definitely doable even with a less than optimal party. I actually beat him in both of my playthroughs first try, which was a surprise to say the least. I was definitely on the ropes near the end, Liu was down, both Callus and Shella were on their last legs, but just before I was ready to give up and start again, he finally went down. After the fight, Callus gets Mizuti to hold Malpercio down, and he heads into the evil god to get Melodia back. Thankfully, after enough time, Callus' voice actually reaches her, and he's able to bring her back from the brink, her hair returning to its original color. With his core removed, Malpercio can no longer easily sustain himself, and Melodia, with the help of the restored ancient relics, the magic of the ice witches, and the player's power, finally destroys Malpercio. And now something strange happens. With the power of the gods no longer keeping the world as it was, something was bound to change. The taint clouds disappear, showing the world what the ground truly looks like for the first time in millennia, and with no end Magnus power to support them, the floating islands fall to earth, becoming land continents once more. With everything finally finished, everyone celebrates their victory, but Shella goes off on her own for some reason, with Callus following after her, where we get one final twist. Shella knew that Callus and Melodia were working together all along. She saw them in Moonguile Forest while they were going over their plan to get Callus working towards the goal of finding the Ed Magnus. Wanting to keep this hidden after Callus collapsed in the forest, Shella got Mimai, the Greythorn, to bring him back to the village and joined up with him to keep an eye on him. But Callus wasn't the only one hiding things. Shella had some new secrets of her own that she'd kept up until now. She calls herself the last of the Ice Queens because the Queens of Wazen have a special purpose. She isn't just the Queen of Wazen, she isn't just a magician, she is the one who holds the ocean that was lost long ago. During the ancient War of the Gods, which resulted in the five continents being risen into the sky, the ocean was hidden within the Ice Queens, who held it for generation upon generation until the Earth was restored. And now that the islands have returned to the Earth, it's time for her to uphold her final duty and become the ocean that she's destined to be. This is another really immersive moment for me. Shella doesn't just ask Callus to help her free the ocean, she asks the player as well. We have to participate in the ritual, say the prayer that will free the ocean from inside her. It's pretty sad knowing that we're going to be responsible for making Shella disappear, but it's her last wish so we may as well honor it. But just before we are able to finish the prayer that will release the ocean, we get another surprise. It turns out that Geldeblame isn't dead after all, he ambushes the two and triggers a final fight. Now I kind of don't understand why this is a thing, like, at all. Geldeblame's story ended and he doesn't really serve much of of a purpose here. Anyways, his fight is really easy, he doesn't hit very hard, and if you manage to land a spirit finisher, regardless of his HP, he dies. Once this is done, Shella finishes the ritual, and this scene actually kind of irks me. Shella goes on about wanting to be a couple with Callus, that sort of thing, but I dunno, I never really saw any real chemistry between the two. Like, I saw that Shella seemed to have a crush on Callus for some reason that I don't understand, because Callus was a huge ass for the majority of the game. But regardless, that never felt like it was actually reciprocated by Callus at all until this very moment. Honestly, it felt like Callus had a closer connection to Melodia, so his overwhelming grief with Shella's death doesn't quite land for me. I don't know, maybe I'm being overly critical of this moment, and everyone else on Earth is entirely for the Callus x Shella ship. Anyways, with her duty completed, the ocean returns and fills the barren land, causing everyone's wings to disappear as they're no longer needed, and they can resume their lives on the fertile Earth. Then in another super weird moment, all of the grey thorns of the world merge together to create a blue whale? 
cool. I don't know, man, that part's just strange. Later on, in Necton, everyone has joined together to wish the player goodbye. Their duty is done, and the spirits are no longer needed in this world. After thanking the player for everything they've done, Callus breaks the bond between them, allowing the worlds to be fully separate again. However, just before we leave, Callus is given Shella's pendant, which some kids found on the beach. By holding it to his ear, he's able to hear her voice, and upon doing so, releases her from the ocean. Yeah, kind of like when you put a shell to your ear and you hear the ocean. Get it? Shella? Shell? Yeah, it's super ham-fisted, but you know what? I don't mind. This is the sort of game that needs a happy ending, and Shella's disappearance didn't really have any purpose anyways, so whatever. With that, we say our final goodbyes, and we slowly fade from their world to leave it in a much better place. A place that will hopefully let them live happy and safe lives forever. And that was Baton Kaidos, Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean. It's really hard to explain how much I love this game, because honestly, it does have a lot of really small problems that can add up to be pretty big if things go wrong for any one person playing it. The battle system's shortcomings are obviously the biggest issues, especially when it comes to single enemy bosses, which can be missed miserable due to the game not having any sort of discard system to cycle through cards fast enough, and other things like how lopsided the game can be when it comes to quest availability and linearity, I can definitely see how some people may end up not having an amazing time with the game. Even on the story side, while I did have to abridge a bunch for this video, and while I do think most of the game's narrative succeeds immensely, there are a few character arcs and relationships that don't quite work as well as I'm sure the writers thought they would. And of course, people will have have to either deal with no English voice acting at all in the regular remaster, or deal with the objectively pretty terrible VA in the original. But honestly, pretty much every single shortcoming this game has is something that I personally don't find to be too detrimental to the overall experience. Yes, it has some annoying aspects here and there, but considering how unique, how experimental, and how engaging the overall experience is, I'm willing to forgive a few rough edges here and there. Except for RNG battles, those are terrible and should have never been included in the first place. Honestly, I can't recommend this game enough for people who are deeply in love with RPGs, especially those who long for the days of the late 90s and early 2000s, where games were a lot more experimental and took far more risks than you'd be able to get away with today. And while I do have some issues with the remaster, there are quite a few bugs around that make the experience a little less than amazing. If you have a Switch, this this is probably the best way to play it. The quality of life changes it makes are well worth any bugs you may experience that weren't in the original. But I'm in a bit of a pickle because I truly don't think that there is one definitive way to play Baton Kaidos. The gameplay is definitely more refined and better in the remasters, but honestly I think the experience is more pure in the GameCube version. But whatever version you play, I think it will definitely be worth your time, as it is absolutely one of my favorite games ever. Now, thankfully for me, the Baton Kaido series didn't end with this one entry, and three years later, Monolith, working specifically with Nintendo this time, would release a second game, one that I haven't had nearly as much experience with, the prequel Baton Kaido's Origins. I can't wait to tackle that one whenever it happens. That's a problem with playing these massive games twice before writing scripts, it takes forever. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching. And just before we end the video here, I do want to shout out my amazing paid patrons, R.A. Miller, Anon42, and Louis G. You're the best. Thank you so much.